Good afternoon, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, on behalf of the Institute of International and European Affairs, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's event, which is part of the Global Europe Project, supported by the Department of Foreign Affairs in Ireland. This project aims to contribute to the debate on Europe's role in the world and Ireland's role in the multilateral order, with particular reference or in the particular context of Ireland's term which, which we, we've just uh, begun uh, as a non-permanent member of the Security Council. We're delighted to be joined today by Gara Peterson, the UN Special Envoy for Syria. Um, Gara will talk to us for about uh, 20 minutes or so, and then we will open up to questions from the audience. Uh, you can join the discussion using the Q&A function on the Zoom, which you should see on your screens. Please feel free to send in your questions uh, throughout the session as they occur to you, and we'll come to as many of them as possible. I'd like to welcome also those who are watching the event on YouTube. Uh, today's presentation and the Q&A session are both on the record. Um, so, Gary Peterson is one of Norway's most distinguished uh, uh, diplomats. He's had a, a, a very, very uh, um, a successful and high-profile career. He, with a strong emphasis on the Middle East, um, he was a member of the Norwegian team to the Oslo negotiations in 1993. Later on, he was Norway's representative to the Palestinian Authority. Uh, he worked for the UN in a number of roles, including as the Secretary General's personal representative for Southern Lebanon, 2005 to seven. And then he was the special coordinator for Lebanon, 2007 to eight. He was Norway's ambassador to the UN uh, from 2012 to 2017, when I had the very good fortune to work closely with him and indeed to count him as, as a good friend. Um, uh, Gar went on uh, to become the Norwegian ambassador to China, 2017 to 2018. And since January 2019, he has, as I said, been the UN Special Envoy to Syria, an absolutely critical job on one of the biggest challenges uh, facing the world. It's uh, uh, very nice for me to reflect that uh, Ireland and Norway are both now members of the Security Council together. Uh, we competed in a very gentlemanly or gentlewomanly fashion against each other. Both were elected. Uh, and now it turns out that both are co pen holders on the Syrian humanitarian file for the Council. So, for a number of reasons, we're Blessed to have Gair with us today, Gair Peterson, uh, to speak to us about Syria. Gair, over to you. Uh, David, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. And also for the invitation to be with you here today. Uh, you know, as you know, I'd hoped to be with you in Dublin. But of course, with the mm -hmm. pandemic, uh, here we are. And uh, David, you know, lots of fond memories from our time together in New York. And of course, in particular, your leadership when it came to uh, the Sustainable Development Goal and that, you know, the miracle actually happened, that we were able to actually agree on those principles back in 2015. So I, I think we all owe you a, a big thanks for the wonderful work that you were doing uh, back then. And as I said, great to, great to see you again uh, today. Um, you know, when I took on this job, I was told by, by my friends and people who knew better that um, uh, I, I must be stupid to take on, you know, uh, the most uh, impossible job in the, in the world. And, uh, you know, in hindsight, they may have had a point. But anyway, here I am. Let me, let me try to give you, um, you know, I try to summarize sort of my intervention in, in 10 points. Uh, it's a little bit overlapping, but anyway, it's a way for me to, to, to sure. organize it. And let me start by sort of stating the obvious. And that, of course, is that any discussion of Syria must keep uh, front and center the depth and scale of the suffering of the Syrian people. The conflict has now in March been going on for 10 years, and uh, the Syrian people have seen death, injury, displacement, destitution, detention, torture, terror, violations, 
in dignity, in stability, intervention, occupation, division, de-development, and devastation on a massive scale. And remember, today, millions inside the country and millions of refugees outside are grappling with profound trauma, extreme poverty, personal insecurity, and a deep sense of hopelessness for the future. Half the population have left their homes. We must never forget this. Second, and this I believe, I'm, or I'm afraid is, is a very important point. The grievances and actions that led to this conflict have perhaps only been exacerbated by it. And the cause of the conflict has only deepened the sense of each that they face existential issues. And it has deepened the depth of their mistrust of each other's. Today, the Syrian parties seem deeply entrenched in entirely different narratives of the origins and the cause of the conflict and the route to solving it. And third, Syria, and you know this, of course, is a profoundly re regionalized and nationalized conflict. The effects of the conflict have been felt across the region and the world. And today, five armies, Russia, Iran, Turkey, the United States, and Israel intervene in the theater. Syria is uh, broken into at least three areas of de facto control. One by the government uh, with Russian and Iranian backing, something is somewhere between 60 to 70% of the, the territories. A second area where Turkey and armed opposition groups uh, prevail. And of course, you also have spread around Alongside this, international terrorist groups, Daesh and al-Nusra. And the third zone, uh, where US umbrella and the SDF, the Kurdish element, prevail. On top of this, the economy has collapsed. You know, it, ha it has been a, what I call a perfect storm of factors. The impact of a decade of conflict, uh, the global economic uh, conditions due to the pandemic, the spillover from the Lebanese financial crisis, internal factors uh, such as war economies, corruption, mismanagement, and external factors and measures has produced a slow tsunami that is crashing all across Syria. According to Ocha, more than eight out of 10 people are living in poverty while the World Food Program estimates that 9.3 million people inside the country are food insecure. With rising inflation and bread and fuel shortages, we can expect the Syrian government and other de facto authorities to be increasingly unable to provide basic services and subsidies for basic goods. As you all know, Syria is under Western sanctions tied by Western players to multiple issues arising from the conflict and demands on the Syrian government. Amidst this complex and grim reality, and after 10 years of war, there is really no easy path to a true end to this conflict. Let alone today when the Syrian people could determine their own future. For Syrians today, the struggle to survive crows out many other issues. And yet the yearning for the, of the people of this, what I call the ancient and proud state of Syria to get beyond this conflict and to a better place is deep and strong. So for me, as the UN envoy, it's always not enough to curse the darkness. We must also be able to see the light and to at least light a candle that can chart a path for the Syrian parties, the region and the world to end this suffering end this conflict and find a solution. And here, let me move on then to what is my fourth poem. And uh, this is obvious, but it has to be said that there is no military solution to this conflict. This has, of course, been through throughout the conflict, but I think it is no truer than ever. The last year or so of the conflict has shown this anew. Since March or last year, as you will recall, in March last year, we had uh, 
heavy fighting in the northwest of Syria in the Idlib province. Uh, it ended with a cessation of hostilities between Turkey and Russia. And since, since that, the front lines in Syria have not shifted. And I think we have now come to, uh, to a situation where we can say that no one actor and no existing group of actors can restore Syria's sovereignty, just as no one actor and no existing group of actors can determine Syria's political future. It is only, and this is one of my key points, of course, is only via a negotiation that this could be done. And that brings me to my fifth point. There is a framework for a political settlement of Syria. And that is, of course, Security Council Resolution 2254. It was uh, passed unanimously in uh, December 2015, and it contains all the elements needed for a political settlement of the conflict. Like all resolutions, uh, it reflects the time in which it was written, and there have been profound changes on the ground and internationally since then. Yet it stands the test of time by providing what I call a balanced and comprehensive set of issues that need to be addressed to resolve the conflict. This framework, however, cannot be implemented by a diktat. And while it exists on paper, it of course doesn't really exist truly on the ground. And to change that, this is the key issue. That would require, I believe, all Syrian and international parties to work with me to carry it forward step by step by mutual and reciprocal measures. There is, in my opinion, no other way. I have sought in the first two years of my mandate to facilitate building blocks that could begin to turn the resolution 2254 from a roadmap to a concrete path. And this has as you can understand, not been easy. I'm currently taking stock of the state of implementation of the resolution, consulting widely, uh, but as of now, I'm ready to share a few things with you. And this brings me to my sixth point. The calm of the past 10 to 11 months is indeed what I would call a fragile calm. This past month, again, was a testament to this. We have seen an abrupt and significant, significant escalation around Ain Issa in the northeast Syria. We have seen an intensification of airstrikes attributed to Israel. We have seen continuous uh, ISIL attacks in the east and the central area. And we have seen mutual shelling and airstrikes in and around Idlib. And this is important, turbulence in the southwest. It is also what I would call a relative calm. With that, I mean civilians continue to be killed in ongoing crossfire and IED attacks as late as earlier in this week in modern Syria. And of course, Syrians also continue to face a range of other dangers from instability, arbitrary detention and abduction to criminality and activities of UN listed terrorist groups. So resolution 2254's call for a nationwide ceasefire in Syria remains both a humanitarian and political imperative. It would also enable an all out effort to counter COVID-19 across front lines in Syria. But relative calm on the ground and even the reduction of violence alone cannot address the root causes of the Syrian conflict. And this brings me to my seventh point. There is a need for other steps on the ground between the parties that could address urgent humanitarian concerns and also build some trust and confidence. First and foremost, full and unhindered humanitarian access. And an issue I have dealt with from day number one, progress on detainees, abductees, and the missing. And at the very least, information on the missing and access and the release of women, children, and the sick of the elder. There have been some release taking place in negotiated exchanges, 
but these are not of a scale and character that would contribute to building confidence and trust. And that would be important for instance, for refugee return and for future elections administered in the UN supervision with all Syrian, including the, the diaspora eligible to vote. That indeed is the end point of resolution 2254. So what I have called a virtuous cycle of steps on these issues would help also to move towards a safe, calm and neutral environment in Syria and would be a cornerstone to uh, what I call a step for steps approach of various actors. However, and this is my eighth point, there is therefore a need for Syrians to reach some political accommodation, including by putting in place a new constitution. The constitution could be a vehicle for addressing many concerns among the Syrians, and it could, if approach properly, build trust and confidence and open doors to other issues. At present, the Syrian Constitutional Committee is the only forum where the Syrian political parties, the government and the opposition are discussing the future of the country. This body established by agreement of the parties and in which sits, as I said, members nominated by the government and the opposition but also of civil society, can be an important piece of the larger puzzle if we can get it to work. It has met five times here in Geneva. There have been interesting discussions, but as I said last week after the fifth session, it is not at present working as it should. It needs to be a forum that builds trust, not the opposite. For that, it does need a serious uh, work plan and genuine interaction on concrete substantive proposals. And it needs after 15 months of work to work to make progress. And as I said after the last meeting, we can't continue the way it has worked so far. But this brings me to the obvious ninth point. The United Nations cannot on its own bring about a solution to this conflict. Nor are the solutions only in the hands of the Syrians. What is needed is what I call a constructive international diplomacy of Syria. Much more can be done to maintain international peace and security while also looking at practical and concrete ways to safeguard and restore Syria's sovereignty independence, unity, and territorial integrity, and promote the implementation of Resolution 2254. There is a need for key players to come to the table together, not just in their current groupings, for a series of all encompassing discussions to address the various com components, what I call a serious cooperative and constructive international diplomacy. This really should be possible. Uh, the Council still remains committed to Security Council Resolution 2254. And despite their well-known differences, key states, in my opinion, have shared interest in seeing Syria out of a state of conflict, crisis, and chaos, including on issues like stability, containing terrorism, the safe, dignified, and voluntary return of refugees, and preventing further conflict. And let me also emphasize that I do believe that the differences between the international players are not strategic at their core. This comprehensive approach, inclusive of all issues and all actors, moving in mutual and reciprocal steps on all the issues outlined in resolution 2254, could unlock genuine progress and could chart a safe and secure path out of the crisis for all Syrians. By creating this dynamic of reciprocal measures, we could slowly see the establishment of a safe, calm, and neutral environment, allowing any constitutional reform to be matched by positive conditions on the ground. Such steps would also contribute to refugees returning in a voluntary and safe and dignified manner. 
There are also other issues where there remain ample room for constructive diplomacy, such as sanctions and working towards Syria's economic recovery and prosperity. I continue and I will continue to engage widely on this front. And I do believe that it is extremely important that uh, we make sure that uh, we have a concerted, sustained and robust diplomatic dialogue among key players. And indeed, this is a prerequisite for this approach. Of course, particularly between the United States and Russia, but also the states of the Astana format, the small group, and of course, the UN Security Council. I'm of course uh, aware of and not blind to the many challenges facing the international community, but my strong message to all is that addressing the crisis in Syria is indeed a core interest and the responsibility of all. Before I close, let me return as my 10th and final point to the Syrians. I deal, of course, daily with the Syrian parties who are fighting, but they are not the only ones we engage and not the only ones at the table. I, ref I refer here to the many voices of Syrians from all walks of life, women and men, who continue to inform all aspects of our work on implementing Security Council Resolution 2254. And this is largely thanks to a consultative mechanism which my office set up in 2016. Indeed, the Women's Advisory Board, the WAB, and the Civil Society Support Group. The Women's Advisory Board comprises 17 women from civil society of a myriad points of view and political persuasions. Over half its members are based inside Syria and continue to amplify the rich diversity of women's voices living inside Syria, while bringing at the same time an important gender lens to these discussions. They also provide important insights on the range of other critical issues related uh, to the political process. Meanwhile, the civil society support room has brought the inputs of approximately 1,000 Syrian society, civil society actors over the last four years. And I'm pleased to say 40% of them are women. And the regular and sustained engagement with the broad range of Syrian civil society has remained a key strategic priority for us, especially given civil society's role in building bridges and establishing trust across a very divided Syrian society. The profound tragedy of Syria is all the more painful given the common feeling all Syrians have about their unique and special country. I believe it is possible slowly, steadily, surely to chart towards Syria, towards a vision of a common future that could be shared by all. However, it will need a genuine and constructive international diplomacy, as I emphasized today, to support a Syrian Syrian process. Thank you so much. And back to you, David. Thank you very much, Gair, uh, for a very powerful um, and uh, eloquent uh, presentation on the challenges Syria faces and which are central to your own role. I mean, you, you've struck many themes there which resonate for Irish people. Uh, and I mean, first and foremost, the, the scale of the suffering, uh, you, you brought that out very, very clearly the dire humanitarian situation and full and unhindered access uh, for humanitarian workers is uh, absolutely critical. And I know that's one of the things that you have been prioritizing. Um, and then the fact that there is a clear political framework uh, in Resolution 2254, the, 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 um, the uh, elements for a settlement are there, but uh, there is the lack of political will in some quarters to actually uh, uh, engage on that. Um, you made uh, lots of points which I, I would like to come back on, but I, I'll open the floor now. But it, let me pick out one. Um, I thought that it, what you've done in relation to involving women in the search for progress in Syria is uh, it, 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 it's a particularly important message. I remember from our own time a few years ago at the UN that in earlier efforts to 
launched political dialogue uh, on the future of Syria. The voice of women was not quite silent, but it was certainly uh, barely heard. And there were criticisms indeed of the UN at the time for not having done more uh, uh, to advance that. But you, you, you are heading in the right direction. And I think that the platform you've set up is a very, very uh, important initiative. Now, thank you very much for laying out all those issues and indeed the challenges to the international, international community. Let me go now to questions which have been coming in from uh, many in our audience. Um, and uh, I will uh, pick them in no particular order. Um, here's one from retired Brigadier General of the Irish Army, Ger Ahern, um, who makes the point that um, uh, no lasting peace and reconciliation can take place in Syria without uh, the Alawite or Assad elite uh, embracing it. Um, at the beginning of the conflict, the West in particular sought to remove the Alawite Assad elite. Is this former positioning now an impediment to the UN's quest for political and humanitarian progress? The fact that the West, as it were, made that uh, pronounced effort to remove the uh, what the questioner describes as the uh, uh, Assad elite. Can I try that one on you? I, I thought you would start with more of a softball question, but anyway. Back with a few ones. We've been friends like this, and and so on. <laughs> <But> anyway, <laughs> um, you know, um, I, I think what we have seen um, the last few years is that uh, the focus is no, not so much. Uh, you know, in international diplomacy about Assad. It's about, you know, how can Syria change? Uh, so when I, uh, you know, when I meet uh, with Western interlocutors or uh, Arab interlocutors, you know, the question has become, you know, how can we make sure that we see changes in, in Syria and so they would say that it not, it's no, not, no longer about regime change, but it's, it's about what they see as, as a change of behavior in, in, in Syria. I, I think this is, uh, has been an important development because I, you know, obviously uh, what was mentioned that we, we need, you know, a, a true reconciliation in Syria. Uh, this, this is a momentous task and would uh, require, you know, uh, for the Syrians really to be able to sit down and to address um, what has happened during the last 10 years in, in, in an honest manner that would be extremely, extremely difficult. Let's, let's be honest about this. And, um, uh, you know, when this is uh, in my discussions with my Syrian friends, one of the more sensitive topics. Mm -hmm. And there are very strong disagreements on how to move forward on this, uh, on this front. But I think, uh, you know, to be able even to come to this stage, we need to start addressing the other issues that I have mentioned in my introduction. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Kara. So I have a question here from uh, Eleanor Burnhill, who is a journalist with uh, RTE, the Irish television service, and uh, Elner asks, how difficult will it be for Ireland and Norway to ensure the humanitarian corridor uh, from Turkey into Syria is maintained? And how will uh, the, op basically, how will the opposition from, Perm from P5 members like Russia uh, be, be overcome? They would prefer, of course, the aid to go through Damascus. Um, as you, you know, we have had, uh, until last summer, we had, um, I, I believe, three crossings that was um, uh, made possible by uh, UN Security Council resolutions opening up for what we call cross-border operations and cross-line operations. Um, the, the Russian position has been that it should now be possible to move all the humanitarian uh, assistance, as you rightly said, through uh, through Damascus, in other words, emphasis on cross-line operations. 
we, the UN, has said that no, we still believe that cross-border operations are indeed necessary. And in particular, you know, uh, the situation as it now has become in Idlib with, uh, with hundreds of thousands of IDPs, uh, with uh, economic uh, hardships, uh, with the pandemic, all of these issues, we believe uh, the time has not come uh, to, to, to change this. So, so we are hopeful that, you know, uh, uh, with Ireland and Norway holding the pen on this, that it will be possible to move this, uh, this uh, process forward. Uh, I believe it will come up for a vote, most probably, is it in July or, or June? I, I believe it's uh, July. So there is still a little bit of time to work on this. And, but in the meantime, of course, the key issue is to utilize all the opportunities we have across line and to use effectively uh, the one cross-border operation that we, still, uh, that we still have. Thank you. Thank you, Gar. Um, the question here from Niall O'Keefe, who is with Trocra, one of the uh, leading Irish um, development and humanitarian organizations. Um, Niall uh, points out that progress on the missing and detained persons uh, is of huge concern uh, for refugees and, and many Syrians. Uh, tied to this would be accountability for human rights violations. Could you comment on the prospects for holding the perpetrators of human rights violations to account? Um, you know, I've been, as you know, uh, the 2254, Security Council Resolution, resolution 2254 is also addressing uh, the issue of uh, uh, abductees missing and detained. And it has been the priority for, for my work from day number one. And uh, I have emphasized, you know, in all my discussions in Damascus, uh, you know, obviously with the opposition uh, and with, uh, you know, with, with, uh, with Turkey, with Iran and with, uh, with, with Russia, uh, the importance of this fight. We are now currently, together with the ICRC, working with, with Russia, Turkey and Iran and trying to see if we could uh, facilitate more releases. So far, uh, this has been more of what I would call, uh, you know, uh, prisoner exchanges. What we need is, is a broader exchange that, as I said, could start with, uh, with the elderly, women and, and children and, of course, the sick. And then we need more information on the detainees and we more need more information on missing persons. All of this, I, I think, you know, this is, of course, as I alluded to in my introduction, is a humanitarian issue uh, of, of, you know, a, extreme importance for too many Syrian families. Uh, but it, it is also an issue, if it is handled correctly, that could slowly start to build confidence. And uh, then, of course, as I said, uh, you know, in answer to my first question, uh, then there are many issues uh, that would have to be addressed, uh, obviously, later on. Gary, thank you very much. Um, a question from uh, Nawar Assad, who is uh, a Syrian lawyer living in Ireland. Uh, do you think that um, agreement could be reached on a new Syrian constitution before the presidential election this year? I mean, it would be interesting to hear your sense also of how the most recent meeting of the Constitutional Committee went and whether there's anything which would encourage us from that. Um, thank you. Um, I, the, the last meeting of the Constitutional Committee, the small body, uh, was not a good one. Mm. And we, uh, it, 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 it uh, was to me a, a disappointment. And I, I said after the meeting that uh, we need to change the way the committee is working. And um, I am currently working on some ideas that I will exchange uh, uh, with the co-chair nominated by the Syrian government and uh, the co-chair nominated, uh, nominated by the SNC. And I will also discuss obviously also with, uh, uh, with, uh, with the international uh, community ideas on how to move this uh, process forward. If uh, there is a political will, it should be possible to make progress, but then I need to see uh, that this will actually exist. Uh, I think, you know, we, we don't know yet when the presidential election will be, 
but I think it's, uh, you know, uh, it's fair to say that if uh, things do not change, we would definitely not be able to reach an agreement on this before the presidential election. Yeah. Um, thanks, Gar. Um, a, a question from uh, Claude Quain, who is uh, uh, with the uh, the Institute with the IIEA. Uh, Claude asks, um, uh, what policy approach to Syria do you see the new US uh, administration taking? Um, and secondly, to what extent has the pandemic distracted attention from the ongoing uh, efforts to reach a political settlement in, in Syria? Two quite yeah. distinct questions. Thank you. I, I think we've been, you know, we're all obviously waiting uh, for um, you know, the new administration to, to formulate its policy on Syria. Uh, but if we are to judge from what we know that uh, key persons within the administration has said before they took office, uh, I don't think we should expect uh, big changes in their policy. Uh, that is both when it is uh, related to, uh, to sanctions, uh, when it is uh, related to the uh, question of reconstruction and aid, and of course uh, their presence in the Northeast. I, my assumption and I think this is shared with most of my interlocutors, is that we will see more of a continuity. But of course, as always, personalities matters, and it will be interesting to see you know, who will then uh, be following up this file on a day-to-day on -day basis also in, in Washington. Yes, I, I do depend, believe that the pandemic uh, has made it uh, you know, more, more, more difficult, but, but also you know, it's obviously such um, on, on top of so many other issues in Syria. Uh, and as I said, you know, I, I believe for the Syrians, there are so many issues that now are, uh, you know, maybe a, a strong concerns than, for instance, the work of the Constitution Committee. You know, the, you have the hardship of the IDPs, mm. uh, the refugees, uh, and you, the economic challenges, the social challenges all over Syria. And then on top of it, you, you have the pandemic. So it's, it's really, as I said, it's sort of a perfect storm gathering and a tsunami sort of moving all over Syria, I'm, I'm afraid. Thanks, Gar. Um, a couple of questions from Leonie O'Dowd, who's with the Irish Syria uh, Solidarity Movement. Um, I'll just uh, give you the first one, which really goes back to... Um, well, Leone makes the point that there has been total lack of progress, as we know, over the past decade in reaching a, a diplomatic solution. Um, what other strategies, for example, stringent financial penalties, would you recommend be, be, be pursued against uh, President Assad and his international allies, uh, such as Russia? So what is the scope for international financial sanctions? Um, well, as you, I'm sure the um, um, the one you, uh, the person you mentioned, is well aware of. There are very tough sanctions against Syria, and I'm sure he's also aware of that there are sanctions also against Russia. But um, you know, my my point is that um, you know, uh, all we we need a different approach. Uh, we know the elements we need to address. And to be able to move forward, you know, we need the key international interlocutors to sit together at the table and to address all these issues. And, that, uh, and if that is not happening, the most frankly, the most likely scenario in Syria is that 10 years from now, you will have a new UN envoy. And I can promise you that that, that will not be me. And the issues will be the same, but perhaps yeah. even more, more difficult because you will have then not sorted out the belt of refugees, 3.6 million refugees living in Turkey, you know, more than a million living in Lebanon, close to a million in, in Jordan, and 50% and of the kids not having their education. So this, this is, you know, th these are very, very serious issues. And if we don't approach, approach it in a new manner, where actually the international community understand that when it comes to Syria, there are a lot of common interests, but it would need, you know, you sit down and you address all of these issues. The, you know, uh, sanctions would have to be at the table. 
uh, you will have to have uh, all the issues about how to create a safe and calm and neutral environment in Damascus. The issue of detainees, abductees, and missing persons. You know, uh, the you know how to deal with uh, with uh, uh, UN listed terrorist groups. Uh, you know, all of these issues need to be at the table. It will not be easy, but the process needs to start. Yeah. Uh, just coming back briefly to the issue of humanitarian access, uh, Leonie O'Dowd, the same questioner, uh, <clears throat> makes the point that humanitarian aid via Damascus doesn't reach those in the parts of Syria controlled by the regime. Uh, uh, it, it, it basically, um, sorry, I, my, my question just disappeared. Yeah. She, 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 she makes the point that Residents, for example, of the Rukban camp have, have had no, almost no aid deliveries for years. It, would there be, do you see a route, including a cross-border route, which could bypass Damascus and deliver aid to people such as those in Rukban? Um, you know, Rukban is, um, it, it's, uh, you know, another terrible uh, example of how uh, how dire the situation are for, for Syrians. Uh, I'm sure the, the person who asked the question is aware of that quite a few thousand residents of Rahman has already left uh, the camp. And as uh, I'm sure she is also aware of, this is an area that is controlled by, by, uh, by the Americans. Hmm? So it, it involves, uh, you know, quite a few, uh, you know, uh, very difficult issues. Uh, we have managed, uh, since I started, to have a, a couple of uh, deliveries in Turukba, uh, but it is not a system that is in place and that is sustainable. And here it also goes back to um, differences between Russia and the United States and uh, on, uh, you know, the, the presence of the U.S. in, in the, this, uh, in, in, in the Rukba area, I'm afraid. Yeah. And I can assure you that this is something we, we're working on more or less on a daily basis. I imagine. Um, coming back to the accountability issue, uh, um, a question from Michael O'Loughlin, who is a, uh, he's a member of the Institute. I just have to call it up. Um, Michael, sorry, Michael McLaughlin. Um, he asks, uh, what, what progress has there been on maintaining data and information uh, about war crimes and crimes against humanity for use at a future tribunal at the ICC or elsewhere? Um, you know, and sorry would, to... This cover, would this cover outside states yeah. uh, who involve themselves in the conflict? Sorry to answer like a bureaucrat on this question, uh, but this is really not my file. But as you know, there are other UN entities working on this. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, there are uh, uh, you know serious work on this uh, that I'm sure you know with a question to the to the right people would be able to give you a, a good answer on these questions. That's fine, Guy. No, it's perfectly that's understandable. And uh, um, well, here's a question from Patrick Dempsey of the WFP in Damascus. Uh, to what extent do you see uh, Assad or the Alawites? Uh, sharing power at all, and, and with whom, and what would the country's political setup look like? In other words, would it be federalized or would it remain a centralized state, but with a coalition government? That's an easy question. Yeah, <laughs> it is. And, and, and David, the beauty of it is that uh, I don't have to answer. This is for the Syrians to decide. <laughs> uh, of course, uh, the issue about, you know, a federal, uh, whatever you call the system, one of the issues that they are discussing within the Constitutional Committee. Hmm? So yeah. these are questions that the Syrians themselves are discussing, and indeed that the Syrians themselves will have to decide in the end. Yeah. yeah. Claire, um, the, the question from Peter McLoon, who is a, a board member of the, of the Institute, uh, is the Arab League still playing a role in, uh, in relation to a solution <laughs> to the Syrian conflict? You know, um, I think we, what we have seen in um, in Syria is, uh, you know, a great concern by Arab states that they are, uh, they, I think they feel that they are not really at the table. And that, uh, you know, Syria is dominated by non-Arab uh, state actors. Mm. 
uh, obviously Turkey, uh, obviously Iran, uh, obviously I Israel, and uh, as I mentioned already, uh, the United States and, uh, and, and Russia. So I think there is a, there is, there is, um, there, there is um, a, a, a great concern, not only within the Arab League, but also in key Arab cap capitals, that uh, something should be done to, to fix this. And I'm in, in close touch uh, both with the Arab League and with, with key uh, Arab states, of course, on, on this particular issue. Um, a number of questions, Gaira, just refer to, in, in effect, where we are uh, with the Constitutional Committee. What are the prospects for getting tangible progress? I mean, you've touched on this a little bit, um, uh, but what are the, the kind of concrete steps that could be put in place? Um, you, you know, confidence building steps, uh, because I suppose the, the SEC is really the, the the main game in town over the next few months to get to 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 stimulate some progress. So a number of the questions uh, relate to what we can do towards implementing 2254, uh, but starting from the SCC. No, listen, I, you know, when uh, when we started working on the Constitutional Committee, I think uh, you know we at the UN, I think the Syrian parties. I think uh, key international interlocutors all understood that uh, the Constitutional Committee could only be one element in moving the process forward. And um, I, uh, you know, we, we spent, or I, I, I should, uh, you know, it, 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 it's been, it has been a long process uh, going back to uh, 19, uh, sorry, 2018. And then when I started, um, uh, this was sort of uh, was handed over to me from, by by Stefan de Mastura, my my predecessor, and we spent then until uh, September, so uh, nine months working on this, and mm. it was a difficult pregnancy, I can tell you. But mm. uh, we worked on two things: we worked on uh, getting, you know, uh, of course, fifty names uh, nominated by the government. That was the decision of the government. Then 50 names uh, nominated by the opposition, the SNC. That was decided, decided, of course, by the opposition. But then we had these 50 members from the civil society. And here, of course, that was uh, uh, trying to find a balance so that we could have you know, genuine representatives uh, from civil society. And this turned out to be very difficult. In the end, uh, we succeeded. But in parallel with this, we worked on what we called a terms of reference for how the committee should be working. And I, you know, I had intensive discussions uh, uh, with the then chairman of the SNC, uh, Nasser Hariri, and with foreign minister uh, um, uh, in, with, with, uh, with the foreign minister in in, in Damascus um, and uh, late Malin. And this, of course, were complicated discussions, but it moved forward. And in the end, we managed to form a compromise. And this was actually the first time that the two parties had negotiated through us a paper that they agreed on and then became the basis of negotiations to sit down. And the first meeting we had in Geneva in, um, I hope I get uh, the year and the month right. It was in November 2019. Was it, you know, with all 150 members uh, present here at the UN, at, at the Palais here at the UN in Geneva, was a very good meeting huh? with, mm. with good opening statements from the two co-chairs that sort of uh, indicated that there was a way forward for the Constitutional Committee. And we then had, a, uh, you know, we had established also what we called a small body with 15 from the government, 15 from the opposition and 15 from civil society that would be the drafting body of the committee. And they continued, you know, after the 150 had met with their first meeting. And, you know, if we go through all the five meetings together, I think we find a lot of substance. You know, we, we have actually achieved quite a bit. 
but 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 the what happened i think in the last meeting was that the progress stalled it was you know we didn't see that we moved forward in a met methodology where we just not continue discussing what i said is that we need now to move forward in a manner so we can identify areas where we agree where we disagree and that we could start moving towards a drafting process and we're lacking a methodology to do that hmm? then of course I, as i said i believe there are areas where there may be commonalities and this is what we now need to see also in the future if we are going to make progress um, as i mentioned in my introduction uh, I am now with my with my team working on this, and I will be actively engaging uh, uh, the two co-chairs, and and uh, then based on that we will see what is possible. But as I said, I need to see changes, and I want this committee, if it is to be successful, to start to build trust and to make progress. And I, I need to be sure that this is actually happening to be able to yeah. move forward. Well, the best of luck with, with, with that uh, initiative. Guy, there's a question from um, uh, Husayma Peregrina, who's uh, at the University of uh, Granada. And um, she thanks you for everything you're doing. She um, asks about the Syrian Civil Society Support Room, CSSR. And I think her question is really, uh, what, uh, have they produced her question is have they produced other tracks within the geneva framework i am not quite i suppose she means what kind of impact uh, it has had um uh, is there anything can you comment on the effectiveness or otherwise of the the uh, syrian civil society support room yeah i you know i think what is um extremely important is of course that um through uh, the dialogue we had with uh, the 1,000 members of uh, the, C mm -hmm. the Syrian civil society, it, it, this has, I think, it, it sort of enables us to connect to the realities of Syria. Hmm? Yeah. To hear the yeah. real voices of the, of, the, of, the, of the Syrian people and to, to be informed by their concerns when we are moving forward hopefully in the political process but i i've been very clear you know in my dialogue with uh, with my friends in the, the syrian civil society that this you know they are not there to substitute the political process eh? hmm. but they are there to help to inform us so that we can hopefully move the political process forward in a manner that could meet the aspirations of the syrian people because after all, this is what we are, we are tasked with, is to find yeah. a solution to this conflict that actually meets the aspiration of the Syrian people. And here, the role of the Syrian civil society, the Women's Advisory Board has been, and will continue to be extremely important. Yes, yeah. Um, we're coming to the end, uh, towards the end of our session, Gar. Um, uh, I, I, there is some interest, I suppose, in the extent to which uh, the crisis in Lebanon is spilling over into Syria. Could you say something about that? Uh, what impact is it having so far? It, it has had a major impact um, on the Syrian currency and the Syrian economy. And, um, you know, so this sort of comes on top on, on all the other issues and have contributed to the fact that, you know, have uh, together with the other issues, I, I mentioned the fact that you have a 10 years of, of conflict, you know, uh, this really also had an incredibly strong impact on, 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 on Syria. And as you know, uh, the problems in Lebanon is indeed continuing. So I'm, I'm afraid that there, you know, there is uh, no immediate prospect that um, things will change for the better when it comes to the issues related to the, to the economy. Final question, Gary. You mightn't be able to say very much on this, but how do you assess the posture of Russia at the moment in relation to um, uh, making political progress? Do you, uh, you know, you, you've emphasised the need for constructive international cooperation, diplomatic cooperation, 
do you see Russia playing a role there? Oh yes, I mean um, I'm I'm having um, a very good cooperation with uh, with Moscow. Uh, you know, obviously, um, you know, in my opinion, there there can be no solution to the Syrian crisis without uh, Moscow uh, being on board. Uh, but as I said, it is no longer uh, like this that one party, you know, being at Moscow, Tehran, uh, Ankara, or Washington, or Brussels, or you know, the, any Arab state can dictate the outcome of the conflict. They all need each other. So yes, Moscow is important, but also all the others that I mentioned would be important to bring this together and to be able to start a new to see based on, you know, uh, I think Security Council Resolution 2254, but building on that to move this process forward. And as I yeah. said, this is possible. But of course, if we require a new kind of investment and political will of all the key interlocutors. Yes, yes. Well, that's a very fitting note on which to end the, the event, Skyr. Thank you so much for making uh, the time available and for being uh, willing uh, to um, answer these uh, questions, uh, all of which are, are challenging. Um, we'd like to thank you very much for coming to the IIEA. Uh, it's great to see you again. It's great to hear uh, in detail about the work you are doing, uh, in which there is enormous interest in Ireland, I have to say. Syria is always close to the top of our international uh, interests. And, uh, and in particular now with the role that we will have uh, on the Security Council. Um, so we wish you uh, every success and, and uh, we will be supporting your efforts to bring about uh, solutions on all these fronts, whether it's uh, the humanitarian challenges, whether it's the, um, the, the making tangible political progress, uh, an ending of the suffering of Syrian people and finally uh, realizing the uh, implementing the political framework which has been there since 2254 was was uh, uh, adopted so uh, thank you for all of that the frankness of the exchanges and uh, um, we don't envy you the role and i'm sure in 10 years time you you won't be in it but in the meantime i've no doubt that it will be in better hands uh, than, than yours so Gary, thank you very very much thank you so much really been a pleasure all the best david okay.